Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jocelyne Cesari. I'm a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Mark Tesler, uh, with whom I'm going to engage in a discussion on something we hope will become a common research project with the title you have seen on the page of the event. It's a long title, so bear with me. <laughs> Competing Understanding of Islamic Codes Pertaining to Women in the Arab World. And the subtitle is Political Culture and Interpretation of Islamic Law. So um, Mark Tesler is the co-founder and co-PI of the Arab Barometer, <coughs> and he is a Samuel Eldersfeld Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan. He is the author of multiple books. Uh, you have more of his bio on the uh, page of the event, and so I'm not going to give you more um, details. They are all <coughs> accessible. So what I will do is give uh, Professor Tesla the floor for 30 minutes. And then I will take some position on the, on the last results of the Arab Barometer. So I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, we did have a little bit of a conversation about current events in Israel and Palestine right yes, now, yeah. and uh, we thought it would be too much of a digression to kind of put it up front on the agenda. Uh, we have something that we're particularly eager to have feedback on. Uh, but that if people want to offer some thoughts uh, without uh, taking too long in, in discussion, we can, we can have this be a bit of Q&A if that's what people want. <coughs> I also should say that uh, Justin and I spent the morning putting together the structure of a paper we hope to write. It's, uh, it's, it'll be a new venture for both of us. Uh, it's got a lot of challenges, conceptual challenges, but uh, I think this, the, the conversation we're having today will, will help us move forward on that. So this is the title of my presentation. Uh, the question is really, what does Islam say? Well, it says many things depending on who you listen to. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. <coughs> and I'm going to have to struggle a little bit because the slides are behind me and I can't see them. So I have them on my computer here so I can see what you're seeing. Uh, but it's a good chance that at least once what's up here and what's up here won't be, won't be the same. So <coughs> um, this is just a little agenda of what I'm going to try to go through. I don't know if I'll get through all of it. Uh, but we're talking about this question about how should an Islam be interpreted? Who's doing the interpreting? Who, who's, whose views are, are, are important? Uh, then we want to know, uh, what do ordinary citizens think of this? What do they think Islam says about women? Uh, and, and other things as well, but today it's about uh, Islamic prescriptions pertaining to women. Uh, what do ordinary citizens think that people say? Well, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about the data sets we're going to use. One is the Arab barometer that Jocelyn mentioned briefly, and I'll say a little bit more about that. <coughs> and, another, and the other is a new data, another data set that if you are interested in doing public opinion research in the Middle East, uh, probably that's not what's at the top of the agenda for most of you. But if you are, there's some really good additional data available that I'll tell you about. Uh, measurement, uh, just briefly, which questions am I using? Uh, what am, what's the concept I'm trying to operationalize uh, when, I, uh, when I talk about uh, defining uh, individual citizens with respect to this question? Uh, what are the questions I use? Why do I think these turn out to be good questions? Uh, so a bit about that. Then descriptive findings. I'll give you a picture of what people say about these issues uh, in a number of countries and at a number of different points in time in each country. <coughs> uh, so you'll have some descriptive findings. Uh, there's quite a lot of them, and we'll see how much time we have to, to really go into them. And then finally, uh, I will at the end, if we have time, I want to look at this, this concept that I'm talking about, and I'm going to define it a little bit more specifically as we move along, uh, uh, what utility it might have as a variable. Is it an important de dependent variable? Well, I would say so. We want to account for the variance that this concept uh, uh, in, in captures. Uh, what about as an independent variable? Of what difference does it make for other things? Uh, and finally, in a slightly more complex model, but I'm not going to talk about it in much detail, does it play a role as a mediating variable? So what can we do with this? Uh, <coughs> so here's a little background on the question. Uh, maybe some of these names will be familiar. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But uh, people who have uh, 
a public voice <coughs> who are prominent scholars or in prominent uh, in, uh, Muslim intellectuals, um, they don't agree on this. And here's just a kind of brief overview uh, of two of the people who are best known for their very conservative views. Said Qutb, for example, is an Egyptian who came to the U.S., uh, became very uh, discontent with the American culture as he found it and as he understood it. Uh, and he's been one of the people that, whose text has been particularly important in terms of offering a view, a very conservative view, a very uh, restrictive view, but some people believe nonetheless that it's the proper view, and of course not everybody believes that, uh, and that is that uh, gender segregation is necessary, women should be completely vi uh, covered, they shouldn't be out, out of the home except if absolutely necessary and accompanied by a man. <coughs> Two people in the middle, uh, these are both names that would be interesting for you to know if you're interested in the topic. Yusuf Karadawi, who passed away recently, uh, he was the spiritual leader of the Islamic Brotherhood, in uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, probably the most important Islamic institution, uh, and he was their spiritual guide. Uh, he was conservative in important respects, uh, and he had some views about Israel and Palestine that some people found controversial. Uh, but he took on these, uh, the text of these conservative writers uh, and said, no, they're, they're, they're missing deliberately or not what these texts really say. Uh, women ha should come out of the home. They should be employed and, and educated and full members of society. Uh, and he's engaged in some debates. Rashid Khanoushi, the leader of the counterpart movement in Tunisia, recently put in jail. There uh, have been a lot of messages going around about how to, how to su support him and get him out of jail. Uh, some people have suggested that now that Karadawi has passed away, that he will be the next, mo the next top Muslim intellectual in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Muslim world, or the Muslim Sunni world. Uh, and then a couple of people, maybe you've heard of Fatima Miranisi, a Moroccan woman, very prominent sociologist, did a lot of writing. Uh, we could talk about any of these in more detail. My, my reason for putting it up now <coughs> is just to say this is the context in which ordinary men and women in the countries they're going to be looking at, this is the context in which they live. They don't necessarily, I, I wouldn't say they necessarily are familiar with, with each or even any of these people and know exactly what they say, but they're brought up in a context where the views articulated the, by these people are, are, are surrounding them. <coughs> uh, one last qu a point on sort of the background and, and the question, you know, what does Islam really say uh, and who's the person who's saying it that we should have credibility. This is uh, a word cloud that was developed for a PhD thesis uh, by a young uh, Palestinian American professor. I had the pleasure of being on her dissertation committee. Uh, she didn't do it at Michigan, so I wasn't her advisor, but they asked me to be on her committee. Uh, and uh, she was looking at uh, the impact, uh, the way in which uh, Muslim leaders respond to, uh, to the government. So this is a slightly in a different context, but I think it, it, it's interesting nonetheless. So this is a nice way to capture, uh, in, in a kind of pictorial way, uh, what are the main themes that come through? The context for this uh, is that uh, uh, the imam of the Grand Mosque in, in, in Mecca uh, was getting a lot of support and funds from Emirates. The Emirates had just signed an agreement with, with Israel for normalized relations. Uh, and so uh, this ought to be or could be or should be reflected in uh, the sermons and the, the speeches that, uh, that Sudais gave. gave. Uh, you see religion, Jewish, uh, in here a lot, Jewish. I'm pointing to the computer, you can't really see that. Uh, and um, it also tells us that uh, the views that are expressed by these Muslim leaders uh, sometimes are influenced by the government, uh, for whom many of them are employees, uh, and they are, their salaries and their work is, is regulated or administered by the Ministry of Religious Affairs. <coughs> so it tells us to be a little bit careful about looking at uh, the views of any of the people that I've presented uh, because they're also influenced by everyday political considerations. Karadawi, who passed away, actually was an exile in, in, in Qatar for a long time. Uh, okay, air barometer data. Um, you know, give me, give me time every, every few minutes. I'll, I can see I'm going to wander if I'm not careful. Uh, so I do want to say, anybody, do you know about the air barometer? A couple of you, but not many. So this is a public opinion research uh, project. Uh, we do surveys in up to 12 or 13 countries, Arab countries, uh, every two or three years. Which, how many countries do depend in part on what's going on in the country. There are times when we can't work in certain countries, and, uh, so 
when you see Egypt and Tunisia on here, you'll see that in the early waves they, they, they weren't included. Uh, those countries were, were it, was impo it was impossible to work in those countries at the time. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, probably the, the most important publicly available uh, <coughs> data set on, on Arab attitudes. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to uh, quality control. We've had our issues with that and, and we address them very seriously. You can see here kind of how many we've done, how many waves, how many people we've interviewed. Uh, the two points I want to make about this, uh, the first one's on this slide and the next one's on the next slide, or the slide after, um, that these data are available and they're available for free. If you do public opinion research or, or data analysis, you can go to the website and you can download any of the data here. I maybe should show you this. These are the, the surveys were, and the places where they were conducted and the years in which they were conducted. Uh, all those data are available. You can download them in SPSS or in Stata or in, in R. Um, and um, at the very beginning, we had an embargo. We thought, well, we'll hang on to the data ourselves, do a little research with them, and then we'll make them available. After two years, we hadn't really done very much. We figured this is, this is not a good idea. We just made them available right away. Uh, Wave 7 has recently been cleaned. Uh, we're about, and, and on the website for those who want it. And uh, it's, um, uh, and you're, uh, and you're able to download it, I guess is what I want to say. So the only last thing I want to say about this, there's an online analysis tool. So if you're interested in this and you don't do database research or you don't have the software, you can go online uh, and you can find out what was the answer that people gave to any question in any wave, in any country, uh, and you can do it just in general. 20% agreed with this and 30% were in the middle. Uh, or you can, uh, uh, or you can compare men and women or people in urban areas and rural areas. You can do, a f you can do f quite a bit through bivariate analysis without downloading the data. And, and it's fun to play around with it. And when you see uh, in Tunisia somebody said something in 2011, gee whiz, I wonder what they said two years later because there had been an Islamist government in between. So you can play around with it. Okay, here are the questions I'm using. These are from the Arab Barometer. Uh, there's another data set coming a little later. So here are the questions we used, and it begins with a, a, a preamble. Today, as in the past, Muslim scholars and journalists sometimes disagree, should have said often disagree, <coughs> about the proper interpretation of Islam in response to present day issues. Each of these statements, and we have some statements that don't pertain to women that are not really in this analysis, you'll get a, a little bit of a, a feel for them later on, <coughs> uh, indicate whether you agree strongly or disagree with this interpretation of Islam. Uh, so these are the two questions we've used for this. Uh, they are interesting in and of themselves, and you can see, and this is, this is the pooled analysis of 36 surveys, all the air barometer data uh, that uh, ask these questions, and, um, and you can see there are 41,000 respondents, so it's, a, it's, it's pretty big, and it comes from uh, 13 different countries. Some of the countries were surveyed more than once, and they're in here more than once. So it maybe overrepresents a little bit the views of Palestinians and Algerians and, and, and Jordanians because they were surveyed most often. <coughs> um, but we'll come to the countries separately in a minute. Uh, but, but while they're interesting and I think important in and of themselves, I view them as indicators uh, that operationalize a, a larger concept. And the concept is interpretation of Islam. Whether, whether you uh, are on the conservative or the Ill traditional or uh, illiberal end of the spectrum, or whether you're more progressive, more contextual, uh, or somewhere in between. I'm not sure exactly what's the best way to, what's the best name to give to this dimension, but uh, that's clearly what it is. And, uh, and so it's indicative of, of, a, of, a, of the concept we're interested in, interpretation of Islamic codes pertaining to women, close quote, uh, and not just the specific answer to these questions. Down below at the bottom of the slide, uh, we've added the two of them together. They actually go in different directions, so we had to re uh, uh, the, uh, reverse the direction of, <coughs> of one of the items so that we could just add them together. And we end up with a two to eight scale. If you agreed strongly with the liberal position on both questions, in other words, you said one, strongly agree, as opposed to agree, somewhat agree, so forth, uh, you would get a two. And if you, nev if you strongly disagreed with both, you would get an eight. So we can see the distribution. Uh, it's the pooled analysis, so it doesn't necessarily apply to any individual country. But it gives you a pretty good view, and you'll see some individual countries in a minute, um, that uh, 
about uh, about 30 or 35 percent are on the liberal side. Uh, there are um, a lot of people in the middle. And uh, there are some, but not really very many, maybe 10% maybe or so, that take the more conservative position. That could vary from country to country, but that gives you a sense of, one, what, we're, what, what I'm trying to operationalize, uh, what the variance associated with that concept looks like. So this is a second data set. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, it's a data set that includes the air barometer uh, surveys that we've just seen, but a bunch of other surveys as well, some of which are only available here. Uh, it's called the Carnegie Middle East Governance Islam data set uh, because I, I, prepa I prepared it with a grant from the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York. <coughs> um, and uh, we have a larger N here, more countries. Uh, and uh, using the same two items, we get a slightly different distribution. Uh, a lot of people in the middle. Here's, and, and the last column is the one to, to pay attention to because it removes the, uh, the missing data. Uh, which, are, which you don't see. Uh, and we can see that it is also skewed toward the liberal end. A lot of people on the liberal end, a lot of people in the middle, some people for sure, but less on the conservative end. I'm just going to say for those of you who know something about uh, statistical analysis, that I use factor analysis to, uh, to identify this dimension uh, to, to determine whether it was part of some other larger, more inclusive dimension, or uh, had explanatory power on its own. Uh, and the finding is it had on its own. <laughs> These are factor loadings. I did something similar for uh, building a scale about attitudes toward gender equality. <coughs> I'm happy to come back and talk about that more. I think I probably shouldn't spend a lot of time on it right now. Uh, OK, here's for the Arab barometer data, the first distributions I showed you. Uh, and uh, the mean of that distribution, the one we saw here, uh, is 5.5. Uh, and we can see for each of the, each, for four countries, uh, even though we have more, we didn't do this for all the countries, and Jocelyn and I are going to add at least one country when we, when we expand on this. Uh, and you can see them for the four waves. Wave one is 2006-2007, 2010-2011 uh, for wave two, 2012-13 for wave three, 15-16 uh, for wave four. Um, there are some, we, we, we're not asking these questions in all the more recent surveys, but we are in some and I'll, I'll be adding them. <coughs> uh, what are the takeaway? Uh, that one, uh, Tunisia is different, maybe we'll say something about that in just a second. Uh, that uh, the distributions for each country are pretty similar across time periods. There's a modest amount of variation which means if the mean is uh, 4.7 on this 2 through 8 scale, that uh, there are a fair number, not a huge number, but there are a fair number of people that are pretty much above the mean or pretty much below the mean. And we can say statistically what that means, uh, these are standard deviation scores. But uh, the point is that, uh, one, they're, they're, they tend toward the liberal side. Not a great deal, but clearly to the extent that there's a mean or a median, it's, uh, it's on the liberal side. Uh, there is some variation, not a great deal, but definitely some. Uh, and there is not that much variation from wave to wave. Uh, there are a few places we might want to talk about in more detail. Why is Algeria 4.9 uh, in wave one and 4.2 in wave three? I don't ask me that because I don't have the answer. I'd want to maybe go back and look at the data and <coughs> a few other things. But in general, we get a, a, a pretty coherent picture. The one country that's different is Tunisia. It's consistently uh, less. You might wonder why isn't there Tunisia and also why isn't there Egypt in wave one? Uh, under Mubarak in Egypt and under Ben Ali in uh, Tunisia, you couldn't do this. And so, uh, and we're, and so far we can do it now. We're, there's a possibility that maybe we're not going to be able to do it again in the future. We'll see. Anyway, Tunisia is separate. It's much more liberal, and it's becoming even more liberal over time. Uh, there is some variation, but actually there's, there's more agreement. Uh, there's less variance around the mean in Tunisia uh, than in the other countries. <coughs> this is something you might want to just glance at. We'd probably have to not spend a lot of time on it. For the uh, second bat batch of data, that Carnegie uh, Governance in Islam uh, uh, Middle East data set, uh, I have uh, many more countries. Uh, and I can do what I did here for, for these countries as well. It's a lot to absorb, and I'm not presenting it for that reason. It's to kind of show you what's available. Uh, what, we'll probably, what I would probably do, or what 
I would encourage those of you who might be interested in doing, uh, pick a few countries and look at them in detail, open up this mean, uh, see what the, distributions, what the distributions actually are. Uh, to the extent there's a fair amount of variance around that mean, uh, that's something to investigate. What difference does it make for other things, such as attitudes toward gender equality, for example, or toward democracy? Uh, and uh, on what does it depend? Is it a function of religiosity? Um, we'll see. Uh, I highlighted the few that stand out just briefly. In Tunisia and Lebanon, you can see they're well above the mean, uh, and there's no other country that comes close. Uh, this, is on a, this is on a two through 10 scale. Uh, and in this case, a low score is being, uh, is being illiberal, so a higher score is uh, being more liberal or, or contextual. <coughs> and uh, in Iraq, especially, and this is interesting, and I don't, I don't have the reason off the top of my head, uh, in Iraq, uh, much lower during the f first two years we did the survey, and those were the years of the American invasion and the height of the American occupation. So maybe that's driving people to uh, think, uh, think not, not to think Islam is more important than thought before, but to think that Islam sends a, a comparative message more than they did before. And then the countries in the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, but interestingly and surprisingly, not Bahrain. So this is a picture, and um, you can, uh, you know, we can open it up, and uh, or if you decide to get the data, uh, and and this data set, this Carnegie data set, it's in the Inter Interuniversity Consortium for Social and Political <laughs> Research. I'm sure Georgetown belongs. It's a consortium of a couple hundred universities in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, and you can get those data along with all the, the code book and, and all the documents that talk about how we integrated the findings because they came from different surveys and we had to make them consistent with one another. So these are the four countries I was looking at before with air barometer data. Uh, and I have uh, made them, uh, I've made the concept I'm working with, interpretations of Islamic prescriptions pertaining to women, quote unquote, uh, the dependent variable. The analysis is pooled. So we've got, on, we've got only, only the country, we've, we've taken the countries one, one at a time, but uh, we've, we've merged the waves. So we don't know if what we're finding here, when we consider all four waves together, whether or not this is uh, true of every single wave individually. So there's always the value in opening up the data and, uh, and seeing if you can't unpack the situation a little bit more. <coughs> um, but the findings are interesting. Uh, they require more work in terms of understanding what, uh, uh, what we're learning, as well as maybe some additional statistical analyses. Uh, we can see that, I won't go through all of it, but we can see that uh, women are more likely to have uh, a liberal interpretation of Islam. Uh, and maybe that's not surprising, uh, <coughs> but maybe women uh, would think that Islam is part of the problem uh, and that's some of the reason they don't have some of the rights they want, uh, and they uh, would have a different view. Uh, but in Egypt, uh, Egypt is one country where uh, female gender uh, doesn't predict to a more liberal interpretation of these Islamic codes. Um, religiosity, whether you're more or less religious, um, and uh, that, uh, that predicts in every country except Egypt as well. Well, possibly there's some sampling problems in Egypt. I don't think so because we've been pretty careful, but I would say this is a reason to go back and, and take another look. And you could ask yourself about, um, educa about uh, education and about uh, age. Uh, so this is a, a, a very straightforward multivariate analysis to the, extent that, uh, um, to the extent that we might be interested in testing the hypothesis that more religious people are more likely to support a conservative interpretation and that might not be correct. You might argue that wouldn't be your hypothesis. But to the extent that we might ask ourselves that question, uh, we would see that with age, education, and gender controlled, uh, that variable, now, now conceive of, conceiving of it as an independent variable, has explanatory power to a statistically significant degree uh, in three of the four countries, but not in one of the countries. So you get a sense of, uh, and, and these are all descriptive findings, it's kind of telling you overall what are some of the patterns that emerge, uh, how do they vary from country to country, time period to time period, what do they seem to be associated with. Uh, there's a reason I used, I underlined the word pre predict up here, because I'm, I'm not arguing that this is a causal relationship. It might be a basis for inferring causality, we might want to talk about that. 
Uh, but to the extent that uh, it's not self-evident that that's the case, uh, I just wanted to put predict in there so we wouldn't get in discussions about is it causal or not. <coughs> Here's the last slide. How am I doing on time? Oh, um, okay, I think I'll, well, I'll finish in five minutes whether I get through the slide or not. <laughs> uh, so here I've taken this concept that I've operationalized. Again, I'm just restating it, interpretation of Islamic codes pertaining to women. And I've treated it as a dependent variable, as an independent variable, and as a mediating variable. Uh, these are very simple, straightforward analyses. I didn't spend a lot of time on them. Uh, I just wanted to work them up for a presentation to show you some of the dynamics and the pathways that might be going on with respect to these concepts. Uh, at the top, it's, uh, <coughs> um, uh, it's an independent variable. The dependent variable is support for gender equality. One of the slides I skipped over, it was on the slide for a minute, but I skipped over it mostly, was how I operationalized support for gender equality, which were the questions we used, and to what extent were we was it legitimate to combine these questions and make them into a scale. <coughs> so that's a dependent variable. Uh, and we see that the more liberal interpretation of Islam, if Islamic codes pertaining to women, does indeed predict to more support for gender equality, with a bunch of other things held constant. Uh, these other things turn out also to be important, so there's probably more to the story to, to tell. But in any event, uh, looking at it as an independent variable, yeah, it has some explanation. If you want to account for variants associated with uh, support for gender equality, what, you, what interpretations of Islamic codes pertaining to women you have is going to influence your attitudes, is going to predict to your outcome. Uh, treating it as a, <coughs> uh, a dependent variable, uh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. This was simply treating it as a dependent variable. To what extent did religiosity as an independent variable predict to it? So this is just to give an indication of uh, some of the things that we might look at in relationship if our dependent variable is uh, uh, interpretations pertaining to, to women. Then the slide that I was on, where I kind of lost my track for a second. Uh, uh, here, it, uh, here it treats it as an, uh, as an independent variable. Uh, it was a dependent variable uh, in the previous slide. Here it's an independent variable. And the dependent variable is uh, support for democracy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I hope you can follow this. I'm kind of uh, mixing myself up a little bit. The previous slide was a dependent variable. Here it's an independent variable with the dependent variable being support for gender equality. All of this, even though I've made it, explained it not in the most uh, coherent way, is to give you a sense of the different ways in which this, this variable that we've operationalized might be useful. The last way here is a meeting dating variable on the right, the two. So if we take support for democracy as the dependent variable, for all these things there are questions about measurement and I could tell you the items that we used, and education is the independent variable. So yeah, it seems that higher levels of education predict a more support for democracy. Uh, so why don't I leave it at that? Well. I need to have a causal story. I need to know the pathway. What, what, in what way and in what kind of a pathway does education end up le leading to support for democracy? Uh, well, it seems to run, again, this is a kind of a straightforward analysis with, with only two variables. It seems to run through uh, interpretation of Islam. Uh, once the interpretation of, of Islamic codes pertaining to women is in the model, education seems to be, ceases to be important. Uh, if you follow the statistics, that's an important finding, that there is, we thought there was a direct relationship, but in fact it's probably really an indirect relationship. There's probably, education seems to lead to certain other attitudes, which in turn lead to support for democracy. Well, some of those intermediate or, or uh, mediating uh, variables are, uh, are variable uh, uh, interpretation pertaining to Islam. So uh, the last few slides have just been to, one, give you a distribution. What, what are some of the patterns that emerge in, in a very broad sense? Uh, and then some of the different ways in which uh, the, this, this concept that I'm operationalizing, and I think it's important to know what people think about this, the interpretation of their religion, uh, that's a variable that can, be, can add to our analyses in many different ways including as a dependent variable, including as an independent variable, and including as a mediating variable. So uh, with a little bit of confusion, I managed to stop on time. Thank you very much. So you may...
wonder how do I come into this? <laughs> so to give you a little background, I heard this presentation or uh, a version of it last June, uh, also in Washington DC from uh, Mark Tesler. And um, we started a discussion on what would be a sort of different aggregate uh, independent variable that would be not only on different interpretation of Islam, but locating this different interpretation of Islam within national cultures. Because what is also striking is not only the liberally liberal, it's also the differences between countries that are um, more or less uh, <coughs> following, especially uh, um, when you look at uh, Algeria and Tunisia, they are especially following the same school of jurisprudence. So um, the idea would be, so this is work in progress. So I'm not going to give you a wrapped up interpretation here or a theory. But the idea is to locate this kind of findings into a broader a context that is about here modern political culture and Islam, but really um, what I'm saying here because I am m working really on religion and politics, not only Islam. Uh, it's about the status of religion in modern national communities, something we tend to uh, dismiss or downplay because we look at religion as a personal individual feature, while even the personal individual feature of the same religious tradition, not only Islam, varies from one country to another. So there is an element here uh, that has to be more explored. And so it looks at religion as part of the national political culture. And this means that people have absorbed, internalized <coughs> some elements of what they think is right or wrong vis-a-vis -vis the public space that also includes the status of religion. It doesn't mean that the group as, as uh, totality is uh, more observant or more religious. It can be done for any country from the most secular to the most uh, a fundamentalist, whatever the religion is. For example, we live in a country where there is uh, some expectation and at the same time some tension of what is the role of religion in uh, American nation, right? So that's the kind of elements that usually is not connected between the position of individuals and the position of religious authorities. And so what I am uh, trying to do here in my discussion with Mark is to look at the mediation, filtration role of the national culture. Um, so in the case of Muslim majority countries that I've been following, they have two books on that. One was The Awakening of Muslim Democracy in 2014, What is Political Islam in 2018. The national culture of most post-colonial post -colonial Muslim majority states has transformed Islam as, <coughs> and especially Sharia, <coughs> as state law, which is a huge break from the Islamic tradition. Unlike what people think, usually most people will say, yes, that's normal. You know, after all, Islam doesn't separate religion and politics, which is historically, religiously inaccurate. So the, the existing status of Sharia cannot be apprehended only through the tenet of the Islamic tradition because that's Islamic tradition. There is a, a, a huge change from the status in Muslim empires to the status in national context. And I will show you when I come to the differences, what are the major changes here? So what, what uh, characterizes modern national culture 
is the monopolization of some elements of the religious tradition by the state ruler. And that's what I call nationalization of Sharia. So what does it mean concretely? Um, and before I, go, uh, I give you the three elements of this nationalization, you will see here results that I was using in my previous publication that in some way echo the recent waves of the Arab barometer. When you ask people in different Muslim countries, they would tell you that um, politics should follow the rule of Sharia. And this comes not from the outliers, as I call them, Iran or Saudi Arabia. It comes from all this middle of the road country that we are discussing before. Um, and it's interesting because they also say that the Sharia principle should also apply to non-Muslims, while in the Islamic tradition, they don't. So what happened there? Because Sharia in the Muslim empire doesn't apply to non-Muslims. There is a special term for that, which is called Sharia Siasa, which is different. So what happened in modern time to explain that? And so that's why I call that a more theoretical approach that I want to get into here. So you see here new expectation about Islam that are carried by citizens and that are not only reflected in the position of Muslim scholars across borders, but that are um, embedded in the way that the new nations have been built. So that's why I have called in my work hegemonic Islam, which is um, the way of understanding Islam uh, associated with the boundaries of the nation. So even if you are Maliki, you are Algerian and Muslim, and you are Tunisian and Muslim. And your interpretation of Islam will be bounded, will be shaped by the expectation of the national culture on that. So what has been the major processes of this nationalization of Islam that you can find in all the majority, Muslim majority countries? There are a few exceptions. Lebanon, because it's a multi-sectarian state. Senegal. Uh, now Tunisia has become an outlier a little, and that's why it's going to be interesting to work with Mark on the new stage. Um, and I'm forgetting one, but it will come. But most of the Muslim majority countries follow this nationalization of Islam. So what does it mean? Three things that you find everywhere. And I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm going to say it everywhere. One, nationalization of Islamic institutions and cleric. Again, you go back to the pre-national status, the foundation, the clerics are not paid, not controlled by the caliphal administration. Their mode of selection, their mode of uh, produ producing ruling for the community are internal and peer validated, not by the caliphal administration. Today, ulemas, Islamic universities, are civil servants. This is a break, a major break that nobody has uh, really addressed in the politicization of Islam. This is creating a link between being a Muslim, being a citizen, being a national, and capturing the state. So what we usually associate with Islamist actually starts with the nation state. So that's why in my own work I make the difference between this broader canopy of political Islam that create already the framework and Islamis that are just asking more Islam in the state. But the idea that Islam and state should be associated start with the secular post-colonial rulers. Okay, even Turkey that I'm not mentioning here, who create this idea that Turkey is uh, Muslim and Turkish, Kemal Ataturk. Of course he will push Islam out of the public space, but he will create something that was unsinkable for the caliphate. He will create the Dianet, which is the Ministry of Religious Affairs that deals with the dominant school of Islam. The clerics are paid, controlled, trained by the state. This is a politicization of Islam. 
the original one, so to speak. So that's the first thread. The second thread is incorporation of Islam in the secular legislation. So with the creation of Islam and state law, you have a shrinking of uh, the Sharia that used to cover different domains of life, social interactions, um, economy, <coughs> relations between Muslims and non-Muslims, and also family law. But it was only one aspect of it. Because of the secularization process and because the states are secular, all the other domains, economy, foreign affairs, um, um, administration, all this has been secularized. The only element that to everybody calls today Sharia is family law. And that's why you find most of the element of Sharia. That's why most of the debate today on the extension of Sharia come from how do we moralize the public space? And what is the site of contestation of this moralization of the public space? The women body. Okay? Because that's the, one, the piece that people are most familiar with, that they have been educated with. To be a good Muslim is also to uh, promote a certain moral Muslim vision of the family. And so that's also why <laughs> the Islamists are most of them pushing on this domain. The, the Islamic finance, the uh, Islamicization of penal law, what's called Udud. This is outliers. Again, you see that in Saudi Arabia, you see that in Iran, but most of Islamist parties, even when they get into power, they do not promote or, or, or mobilize for that because they have been socialized in an idea that, you know, the moralization is about family and women in the public space. And this comes from here. The third element, and that's also an important one, is that what used to be the traditional transmission of Islam through the autonomy or independence of the ulema is now part of the state education system. So uh, through the work I have done on most textbooks, you can see that most of the time the history of Islam is associated with the history of the nation, like there is no before. And everybody, Muslim and non-Muslim, because there are also diverse kinds of cit citizens in all of this country, or most of them, you, you have to go through this education. Like a Copt used to say, I am Muslim by nation, and I am Copt by religion. So that is this level of national culture and Islam that uh, that's a work in progress. We don't know. Maybe this is going to be invalidated <laughs> in the work we're going to do together. But that's the kind of concept here that can operate as the independent variable to explain the diversity, but also the middle of the road that you have seen on the question of, of women, co-education, and hijab. Okay? So I have another slide that I'm going to pass because otherwise I can do a whole session on that. So if, <coughs> if the expectation about Islamic code is about family law, what are we talking about? Hmm? So we are talking about marriage, divorce, custody of children. And all the countries that Mark presented, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan, are all variations. They are a middle of the road, which comes up very uh, strikingly in the, in the survey. In all of these countries, some elements of um, Islamic prescription are used to define what's the marriage, what's the divorce, what's the custody of children. I didn't have here inheritance. But everywhere, the question, for example, of education of women is not part of this, really. Most of these countries take it as a given. Why it's not a given in Saudi Arabia right, or in the Taliban? But these are outliers. Because everywhere, the question of women's rights um, is not attacked on the question of what I call individual rights, meaning education, work, and politics. Doesn't mean that the patriarchal culture allows it. And that's why we can make a difference. But by law, there is no differentiation. Again, not Saudi Arabia, 
and um, uh, not the Taliban. What is interesting, actually, Iran, education and politics are part of the domain that women can access. I always make the joke that Iranian women can run for president, but they cannot divorce their husband. That's the kind of morality of the public space and the status of women in it that is part of the national culture. So what was interesting for me in the, in the results of Mark is that the middle of the road is co-education is not really an issue. Of course it's not, because all these people have been educated, including women, that, you know, there is no issue to go to university and there is no issue to study like a man. Actually, I have other statistics for another book that was quite striking that even equality of salary in some Muslim countries is not as bad as we think it is when you compare, for example, with Western democracies. But again, so you see where the question is coming here. Mm -hmm. The hijab, not mandatory. Again, uh, I, I did, uh, we didn't do yet the variation between the countries, but you could see that most of them are what is called this, this big middle of the road. You know, you have very little conservative ones, and you have uh, uh, also more, la let's say, liberal middle of the road. So this is because people have been socialized in this kind of uh, um, Islamic culture. Or I would rather say Muslim culture, because Islamic would involve a more assertive position. So that's why also the, the contestation of the, of the secular state is never about the, the connection between Islam and state. This is a given for everybody from the secular to the Islamist. What the Islamist is asking is more Islam in the legislation. While uh, the secular in this country, they are pretty much satisfied to a certain extent with uh, this middle of the road. Okay, you have <coughs> movements to push. For example, there have been, it was very interesting for me to see that the law of inheritance have been changed in Tunisia and including a huge debate in the Hanada party to, be, to remove the inequality between uh, boys, uh, sons and daughters. Okay? So, but it's not, uh, as you can see, the push has been towards some more recognition of women's agency with limits. The limits, for example, in Egypt is about the divorce. There's been a lot of debate about the divorce. Um, um, in Algeria, there's been a lot of de debate on custody of children. Uh, so a new element that didn't appear in the initial shaping or formatting of this family code was domestic violence that now has been taken into account more and more. So I, I will stop here because that's the work we want to do, to see how much of this national culture, once we really uh, analyze them and define them, can work as independent variable to explain the differentiation between, between countries. And then I, I will just terminate on that because we also want to see it, how much of this uh, middle of the road is covering the majority of the population or not, how much of it is contested. And what is clear is that um, all these cultures are now threatened by what's called the globalized Islamic culture. But interestingly, this globalized Islamic culture is not latching on directly into the pre-national Islamic tradition. <laughs> it's actually just globalizing the ideas that were initially present in different national territories and the influence of, in, of uh, transnational Islamic movements, the Wahhabi, Salafi, Tablir, these, these are pushing a more conservative view of women than the one uh, in the country that we just mentioned. So uh, that's why also you see emerging in this society more demand on the moralization of women's body that was initially present or, or consensual in all this country. So really it's not a definitive uh, you know, response, but to tell you how we, we will try to connect 
between this vision, these this results, and, and the idea of operationalizing the, the concept of national culture and uh, Islam, Muslim national culture. Thank you, Astopia. <laughs> so now I take back my uh, hat of moderator. And the floor is yours. Hello, uh, my name is Yasmina Abu Zohar. I'm a lecturer at Princeton University. Um, I have a question about your cases. Um, so I think there are slightly more conservative countries according to data by the Arab Barometer, like Libya, for example. Uh, I was wondering if you're going to look at the more conservative ones and compare them to the middle of the road <coughs> countries, like you call them, uh, because then you have Tunisia, which is on the most liberal end, I think, in the entire region. Um, uh, sure. I mean, it's driven by what data we have, um, and we have, in more recent times, been able to do Libya. We also did Mauritania once. Um, but uh, we'll need to, I mean, the answer is yes, those are possibilities, and it uh, depends in part on whether we have the data. Uh, we don't ask, we don't always ask all the questions that any one of us would like. We have a lot of bargaining uh, among ourselves and with our partners overseas about which questions are important and how important is it to ask the same question again so it can change over time. But if you want to put in new questions, something has to give. Uh, that's not really your question, but that's kind of the context in which we're operating. Uh, and the number of countries we, we do also depends on uh, the conditions in that country and the availability of funding. We're, we're definitely looking for funding and if anybody has any ideas on that, feel free to share them. Um, so, uh, yes, um, we haven't been able to do as many countries in the Gulf as we would like. Um, and so, uh, and I, I was telling Jocelyn earlier some of the stories about what happened to us in Saudi Arabia when we were in the middle of a survey and the blockade against Qatar came and we were doing the work with a, with a grant from the Qatar Foundation, so we had to stop. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stories here, uh, but it's, it's a worthwhile question and, um, yeah, I think we'll, uh, We'll also have to see how much is manageable. I mean, so the, ar so the article is co coherent, and, uh, and we'll certainly, no matter what we end up including, we'll probably say, you know, there are other countries, and, uh, and we hope that pe people find this instructive, and we'll, you know, come and take some of our data or generate your own data and, and do more. I know that's more than you're asking, but, uh, but yeah, to the extent we can, we'll be considering those possibilities. We have Sudan also. That's also a good case. <coughs> Well, thank you all for sitting so quiet. <laughs> uh, my name is Grace Ackleston. My question is, how does class, um, both in country and then socio or economic differences across countries, influence your analysis of this particular topic? Class? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can both go. You want to go yeah, first? Yeah, or no, 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 no. Um, <coughs> it, 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 it definitely is there in, in, in two respects. <coughs> One is, uh, that we're tr that partly we're going to be treating these uh, uh, this this organizing uh, variable or concept uh, interpretation of Islam uh, at the individual level, and we can we can and are and and to some extent in other studies, not necessarily the one that Justin and I are doing together, uh, we want to see how we account for that variance at the individual level. Uh, and class is certainly something that would be potentially important. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that we would look at. Class or socioeconomic status would be one, and we have some interesting questions that try to measure that in a way that's comparable across countries. Uh, we can't simply ask what your income is. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that's important as well, and they're not necessarily only the, uh, the so-called familiar demographics, uh, education and age and sex, those are important. Uh, but internet use and a bunch of other things. So there's a lot to be done, and uh, and it, it ought to be a collective uh, endeavor. I mean, you you and your friends and others should take the data and uh, do some analysis. <coughs> um, I mean, that's what the data are for, so we want you to do that too. The second way is that in, in terms of how it connects with what we're doing together, and uh, that is that uh, 
I mean, the, the structure, I guess, I mean, Jocelyn can say if I've got this in a way, if we agree, but um, is what is the national circumstance with respect to this modern political culture in Islam or this national culture? Uh, what does it look like uh, as an independent variable, as she said? Uh, and we want to ask, one, to what in general, broadly based, do we think it tends to give rise? And two, uh, how broad and deep is that penetration? Does, that have, does it have that impact on different social classes? So these would be, I don't know, conditionalities or, or we'd be disaggregating the data and looking at the impact of the national circumstance on uh, different classes of people. And, and we'd be disagre disaggregating on other variables as well. Yeah, if I may add, there is, um, <coughs> that's something also that we will discuss and explore. This idea that the more socioeconomically advanced you are, the more liberal you are. And there are lots of um, invalidation of that in different areas. So I cannot tell you now that the causality or correlation right there. But that's what we want to explore because we know through different empirical <coughs> studies that actually educated urban elite, middle class are, are conservative. I mean, they, they can have more, I would say, conservative <coughs> position than the one we are just looking at. So again, oh, we don't have a sure. response yet, but that's the kind of thing we want to look into. Yeah. But that, that's also variance to be explained. So among people in a so certain class, maybe the, let's, let's start with the so-called elites and we'll have to figure out what we mean by that term and how we measure it. But once we've got it, uh, so some are pretty conservative. Maybe that's a surprise to us. Maybe if we knew the country better, it wouldn't surprise us. Uh, but if some are more conservative and others aren't, what accounts for that variance? Maybe it's uh, lower class men, upper class, uh, elite men that are one way and elite women. So if we don't add that additional variable, we really won't account for the variance. And you can't do this, you can't add variables forever and ever and ever and your end gets smaller. But, uh, but certainly in, in terms of conceptually, it's clear what we would do, and I think we can go a fair amount of distance empirically. Yes, hi, um, my name is Amanda, and I was wondering if you have done any research or asked any questions about um, views on interfaith marriage? Um, I don't think so. I'm trying to remember if we have. I'm pretty sure we haven't. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think so. I mean, it would be it would be interesting, uh, and there are a lot of questions that come with that. If uh, uh, a Muslim man marries a, marries a Christian woman, uh, who are the, what are the, what are the children, what's the children's nationality? Well, it's going to be Islam. What if it's uh, a, a Christian a Muslim woman who marries a Christian man? Uh, is it going to go with the father? Or is it going to go with the Muslim? Uh, so I, I, I think these are interesting questions, and I guess that's what you had in mind why you asked it. Uh, but I don't think we have questions on that. Can I add something? Because through <coughs> the work I have done through the different countries I have studied, so the, sha the Islam is the family law that we just discussed is the law by default. Let's say, uh, let's say you are you if you are in uh, in Egypt. You are copt, you marry in your church. You are Muslim, you marry uh, in the Sharia court, that actually state court, okay? I mean, there is no real Sharia court in the traditional sense anymore. So let's say two people from this different religion come together. First, it's hard because there is this two expectation from different family that will weigh heavy. And then the gender is important. For a Muslim man, it's not a big issue to marry someone from the Coptic community, although the, the, the Coptic community will not take it, you know, uh, easily. For a Muslim woman, that's a big issue. And actually, that's why in the statistics we have per country, the, the level of interfaith marriage in this kind of situation is very, very rare unless people take on them to 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 go against this system, you know, and and it, it does have social costs in the in the sense that the, the the tension between the communities on the ground can exist. So I would say it's very <coughs> rare. 
if I can wrap this up uh, together. But it, let's say I don't I don't <coughs> care about my religion and my my uh, partner doesn't care about the religion. We go to the state court and we are married by default under this Sharia law. You, you see what I mean? If you have a more principled and uh, uh, assertive position on how you want your marriage to be, then the problem starts, you know. I would just add, um, I think it would be great if some of you would look at the online ana analysis tool. I mean, just go to the Arab Barometer website, Arabbarometer, one word, dot org, uh, and go to where it says uh, surveys. That's where you can download the data if you want the data. But you can use the online analysis tool, and we may not have asked the question you began with, but maybe there's some interesting questions there that you wonder what people think. And then you can see if it's different for men and women, if it's different for uh, the survey to uh, the previous wave. Uh, I, think, I think you'll find it enjoyable to play around with it. And it leads, and it leads to a lot of questions, things you, c confirms things you thought or uh, challenges things you thought. I think you can have a lot of fun with that. I want to call you B. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share some thoughts and ask two questions, actually, if that's okay. But first, I think it is really interesting to see the attitude in the Gulf kind of speaking to class dynamics, seeing as like, you know, GMP, the national per capita, they're wealthy people, but more conservative than, let's say, like Lebanon was been under <coughs> economic sanctions for like a decade and is not doing that great. Um, so that, that was actually really interesting to see. Which leads to my first question. I was wondering if you could speak to, or if you've conducted any analysis on the racial and ethnic within national borders dynamics. So for example, I am thinking about the Gulf, and I'm thinking about Saudi Arabia, where actually there are more uh, migrant workers and domestic, uh, and, and, and <coughs> domestic workers than there are native mm -hmm. Arab people in Saudi and in, in the Gulf states. I wonder if that shifts attitudes towards, you know, not, not only just women, but also how people buy into this national identity shaped by Islamic culture and, and what, what is considered the, the hegemon for that, whether particular nation state or broadly more in the region. Like speaking as, as a Bangladeshi woman myself, sometimes I resonate, sometimes I don't resonate with attitudes um, towards women with like my odd friends, for example. So I'm wondering, um, you know, and then there's like multiple dimensions there because there's like a diasporic dimension, there's a race, racial dimension, there's an ethnic dimension. So um, if you could speak to that, that would be interesting. Um, and the second question I had was around sectarian dynamics. So again, Lebanon, very interesting case. Um, also like Syria, very interesting. Um, if we are to define like what is the hegemonic Islamic culture um, in either of those nation states, it is deeply shaped by um, who you follow, who is the religious leader that you follow, um, and also recognizing the fact that in the region, actually the, the hegemon is the Sunni practice and Sunni, um, let's say, faith framework or tradition, but when Let's say, I don't know, it could be interesting if we were to like cluster the data by uh, Shia majority. So cluster Iran, um, Iraq, and I don't know, I mean in, Kuwait. in Lebanon it's not really... Kuwait. Kuwait, yeah, let's say there's a cluster there. I wonder what the data would show us then. Sure. Um, so I think I can say something about both of those, but I'm afraid Pretty soon we get a question. We just can't do everything. We haven't done that, so I mean, don't you know? Don't expect too much. Uh, and you know, other people should be motivated to do stuff as well. In terms of uh, your question about the Gulf, <coughs> um, we have data from Kuwait. Our data from the Gulf are, are imperfect and limited to some countries. And some countries have only done the survey once, uh, for some of the reasons I said before. <coughs> um, but a country where uh, I've looked at this in more detail uh, is Qatar. And it's not, well, it's partly connected to the Arab barometer. We've done, I think, two, two surveys there, uh, and some of this is related to other things. Michigan helped uh, Qatar University to build a social research institute. Uh, it was a 10-year project, was finished recently, and they've been doing a lot of surveys. Uh, and there are three categories of the population there. There's the, there's the, there's the citizens, uh, and 
maybe Qatar is sort of an extreme example, but it's like 300,000 people and half of them are children. So, uh, which also means parenthetically, if you're doing a lot of surveys, people are going to be surveyed more than once. Your name is going to come up more than once if the pool is only 150,000 people to select from. <coughs> um, but there are also uh, long-term expats. That's a different category that, you, that maybe isn't the one you mentioned. But uh, um, my, and we've we've done surveys of them. I mean, it's not the air barometer. It's to what the what the Scuttery Institute that we're working with has, has been doing, um, and. Uh, and we've looked, and we've done some comparison of uh, of citizens versus Arabs who are expats but not citizens versus other long-term experts that are not that are not Muslim or not Arab. Uh, and um, my impression, for what it's worth, um, is that uh, these people remain connected to their their home country, to to France or England, wherever they come from. And and even if they've been there 15 or 20 years, uh, and they play an important role. Um, the Qataris don't want them to become Qatar, Qatari, and the people themselves aren't interested in becoming Qatari. So I think, uh, but I mean, we do have some data on this. It's my best recollection, but we do have some data on this. Uh, and then there are the, uh, the guest work, so-called guest workers. The people come on two-year contracts, uh, and they do work that is uh, menial. Uh, and sometimes they're not treated too badly, but sometimes they are treated pretty badly. Uh, and uh, we've done some surveys among them. One of my PhD students did a dissertation about four or five years ago on this <coughs> um, and used some of the data that our institute in Qatar, at the Qatar Institute, it's not a Michigan Institute, we just helped them to create it. <coughs> uh, and their, their issues are entirely different. They're only there to make money, send it back, and be there for uh, a couple of years. And if they've got concerns, it's not about uh, how can I become more Qatari or what do I think about Qatar's national culture, does it speak to me or not? Uh, in terms of Lebanon, um, th that would be great. I can say two things. One, we've done a lot of surveys there, and we have a lot of questions I think are the ones you'd be interested in. Uh, we know whether they're, uh, you know, Druze or Sunni or Shi, uh, and, uh, and if Christian, which, which Christian group. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, one of my former students, if you're interested in the subject, the, you probably have already run into his work. His name is Dan Korstange. And uh, Dan and probably also Melanie Kamet, uh, whose work is not based on surveys, but is nonetheless addressing these questions. There's some really good research to, uh, to look at if you haven't already seen it. Uh, and, um, and if you're interested, uh, I think the data on Lebanon would be quite, ins quite instructive. Yeah. If I may say something on Lebanon, you, you mentioned it as hegemonic Islam. It's actually an outlier. It is not. In this mm -hmm. case, it's more institutionalized <coughs> religious communities. And each of these communities use its own family code with uh, a sort of breakthrough that happened, I think, two years ago, where for <coughs> the first time, uh, it's a sort of back-ended, I, I don't want to become too, too technical, it's not that interfaith marriage like we mentioned before are completely authorized, but you can find ways of making this happen. But it just now, two years ago, that has been a fight uh, uh, in the Lebanese society for a long, long time. So, um, yeah, I, I would not qualify Lebanon as a hegemonic Islam because it's more multi-sectarian kind of... Uh, system. Yeah. With the consociational political yeah. system imposed on top of it. There was another hand on Yeah, it was here. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, so my question was more also in close regard to Grace's question in that uh, you mentioned during your presentation you might have had some sampling issues, I believe, with, with the data in regards to Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. So I was wondering, what was your uh, sam sampling process like, and were there any obstacles facing, such as um, accessing information from like hard to reach groups? Yeah, I, I wasn't really referring to that. I was referring to the fact that, for political con reasons, given the political circumstances, we just couldn't do it in certain surveys. So there, so you will see on the list of surveys that Egypt and Tunisia also uh, weren't done in some of the early waves because it just wasn't possible. <coughs> um, there are all kinds of challenges to doing surveys. Um, and um, they're familiar. Uh, in general, I mean, I could describe our, our general approach, but it's, it's sort of multi-stage uh, probability-based sampling. 
uh, with um, the, the standard unit becoming smaller and finally you get to the household. And uh, we don't use a quiche table. We ask people who, who had, who's the person who had, whose birthday is coming up next? And that's, we assume that's random. Um, there have been, um, nothing in Egypt in particular, um, one of our surveys in Sudan uh, came back with just too many educated people. I mean, we can see they weren't sampling enough. Uh, and, we, uh, and we asked them to, to do some more surveys in categories of the population that are underrepresented. Uh, and we do stuff like that sometimes. Sometimes we just say, well, we can't do everything, so we'll wait the data and hope that that uh, uh, addresses the problem. Um, so, and I will say we have, a, I think, a pretty rigorous quality control. Um, we have, uh, there are some gaps in the data. In some, certain, countries, certain countries weren't surveyed in certain ways. And one reason is the conditions in the country like Tunisia and Egypt just didn't make it possible. But that's not the only reason. Some of those gaps are because the data are bad. And after agonizing a bit, we said, uh, we can't really clean them, let's just throw them out. So you'll find, uh, I can think of two in particular, not too many, but a couple. Uh, and, uh, and maybe a third one, which is partially what I'm saying, um, that we just, uh, we said, you know, it's just not worth it. We'll just not have those data. Uh, so, I mean, that's a partial answer to your question. Okay. Last call for question. Yeah. Well, Ella, what are you going to write in your story? We have a reporter here. We're being, uh, there's a reporter in here who's going to tell the story of what, what the, she heard. Sure. Didn't want to put you on the spot. We're just, <laughs> we're looking for questions. Okay. And um, I think maybe we'll forget about Israel-Palestine. Yeah. Yeah, I think if it, didn't, if it didn't come up, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, because it's Okay. Like yeah. Nothing. Yeah. No. Um, I guess going once. So if there is no more uh, question from the floor, I think we're going to close up. Thank you for, um, oh, there is one so more. Okay, question actually, but I'll add something uh, to your, um, Lecture. If, um, yeah. There was some pressure on the ma male side, uh, but it did not attract attract much attention, public attention, I would say. Uh, with um, with Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, uh, after the Turk Turkish revolution took revolution took place, uh, there was a ruling about removing the turban and wearing the, wearing the hat. It was a part of Turkish constitution until recently. If it is not removed although it's not applied in anymore. Another thing is, uh, there's also another period called postmodern post coup, which, which took place in 1998, I guess. And at, the, at that time, ladies were not allowed to attend universities with a hijab, with headscarf. And males were not allowed to attend universities with beards including the type of beard that I had. So yes, there was some pressure on males, but as I said, it probably did not uh, attract some public attention. Oh, that, that's a good point you are, you are mentioning, which is uh, evolution, transformation of expectation. And also one thing we, we do not take for granted is that the more the time passes, the more liberal it becomes. What we are witnessing everywhere, and that's why we want to add Iraq too, and uh, Mark mentioned this. Sometimes it go, the expectation is a teleologic vision that it goes more and more liberal. That is not uh, particularly true. Uh, in a country like Turkey, for example, it's, uh, uh, it's going up and down. Iraq is one of those. Um, so that's the kind of changes according to the different moment where these national cultures are also influenced by internal dynamic, but also external events, right? Um, 
But w just to finish on that, I mentioned Turkey because Turkey is always presented as a secular state, which means in the Western expectation, a separation or neutrality of religion from the state. And that is not the case. It has never been the case. Meaning what, what uh, the secularization in Turkey mean, meant, it was a, a privatization of religion at the social level, but a complete politicization and absorption of Islamic institution into the state system, which is unheard of until the nation state. And, and so that's the kind of discrepancy. That's why when we compare secularism in the UK or in France and in Turkey, we, it's like comparing apple and oranges. Because what level of secularization are we looking at? Um, and w m in my research, it's clear that the secularization in most of Muslim majority country went with an institutionalization of Islam and the control of Islam by the state that didn't exist before. While in, in the mind of everybody, it means neutrality of the state. And, and that's what we want to break here because um, because Islamists don't come from another planet, you know. If they come from this kind of culture when it expected to be a good Muslim, a good citizen, implies control of the state. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can go on and I prefer and, and to. That, <laughs> that brings up the question to the extent that that's a common denominator, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. there are differences in the state. Yes. What are the, what needs to be added to that common denominator to show how it, how, it, how it varies and why its Absolutely. impact might be different. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. So if this was the last remark, quick, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are closing now. Thank you for coming and thank you for your question. Thank you. To be continued, maybe yeah. we come back with yeah. a whole yeah. wrapped up paper in a couple of years. Thank you.